Okay. We are now live and recording. So, uh, welcome. This is the final of the three series of Excel trainings that we're going to put on for now. Um, this one is all about formulas. Uh, we call it the if, ands, and buts of uh, Excel. Um, there are multiple types of formulas. We're going to go through. Every, we're going to go through some of them. Um, the ones we go through today are the ones that I use on a more regular basis. Um, uh, unlike some of the other trainings where we really dealt specifically with uh, some specific ut uh, Utopia reports, um, this one is kind of just a little bit more generic just because some of it is very basic. I mean, we go from the very basics of add, subtract, multiply, and divide to um, date diff formulas, and I'll we'll explain exactly what those all are. So this one will be a little bit differently, not as uh, adult ed focused, but um, as we go through it, if you've got questions, how do you use this? Where and if I do point out, hey, I use this one in adult in in, in adult ed stuff, then I will point that out. So, with that, uh, let's go ahead and start um, formulas in Excel. Um, they decrease the amount of time that you can spend in Excel uh, when formulas are used specifically with cell references. Um, rather than pulling a calculator out, pulling a phone out, something like that, they actually decrease the amount of time. Um, and, and you can uh, summarize a lot of uh, data very quickly with some of these formulas. Um, as well as when you start actually using cell references, you can change data very quickly, change percentages to figure all that mm -hmm. out. And you will actually see a lot of information gone through very quickly. Uh, do you mind putting Robert? Yes, give me just a second, Robert. Sorry, I just pulled the chat. Um, there it is. Okay. Uh, that tiny URL is now in the chat box for everybody. Um, so you can go ahead and access it there. Um, they also increase the accuracy of your uh, of your data and your reports. When you use cell references and you actually start grouping th uh, like cells together, start using formulas within it, you actually increase the accuracy. Um, that way you can include all of the data rather than trying to just calculate things within a calculator. There may be, say, a month you skipped if you're doing budgets. Um, there may be students that you skip if you're trying to do, say, average contact hours or just trying to do yes, no's, that kind of stuff. So it decreases the amount of time that you'll spend in Excel, as well as it will increase the accuracy of your reports that you are working with. Um, as a base, um, a lot of people forget this one, and it's it's one that I've forgotten a number of times. I've actually gotten a lot better over the last couple of years. All formulas in Excel must start with an equals by with the equals sign. Um, doesn't matter what you use, um, whether it's simply adding two numbers together, subtracting two numbers together, or when we start getting into if statements or date diff formulas or that kind of stuff, every formula must start with an equals sign. So uh, that's just something to remember. Um, so if I ask, um, this one is a lot more, lot more interactive than some of the others. So feel free to unmute yourselves as we ask different questions and get responses. Um, if I ask for a formula, just make sure to stay the equals in front of it. I know. It, it kind of gets tedious and repetitive, but it's something, it's a good reminder as you get into a habit. Um, I do that when I do a lot of trainings as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Basic math. Uh, basic math, um, you can add, uh, let me go ahead and open up all these. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. You can do every one of those within Excel. Um, add and multiply, there are actually two different ways to do both of those. Um, with add, you can either use the add sign, the, the plus sign on your keyboard, um, or you can use, there's actually a formula called the sum formula. So if you hit equals, type in sum, open up a set of parentheses, then uh, you can tag a bunch of numbers or a cell or a lot of cells in there and it will add them. Um, subtract and divide, unfortunately, there's only one way to do it. Um, OK, I shouldn't say that. There are actually multiple ways to do it. You could use both the sum and the product uh, in order to subtract and, multi and divide, but most people don't. Um, in, in, even with add and multiply, there are a lot of people who will do just simple pluses and, uh, excuse me, stars for the multiply. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, go ahead and open up that Excel sheet that um, you all downloaded and go to the very first tab. 
on. I screwed that up. So, Adam, can I ask a question too right now? Sure. So, I, I know I've seen formulas for the diff. I, I always thought that diff was for subtraction. Is that not correct? Nope. The diff formula. They actually don't have a diff formula. There is a date diff formula, which does. Um, we'll actually talk about the date diff formula for um, figuring out the difference between two dates. Um, but there's not. There is not a diff formula. If there was a, if 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 people had programmed in a diff formula. Now, I will say with Excel, there are a lot of uh, um, other tools that you can add on to Excel, uh, third party tools. And maybe one of those ones had a diff formula that that was programmed into it. But with the standard Excel, there is no diff formula. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so go ahead and go to the basic math tab down at the bottom. Uh, should be the one that uh, loads up. Uh, you can see that in column B, I've got add, subtract, multiply, divide. You'll see that add, multiply, I have the sum. Uh, below that, you'll see apples, oranges, bananas, peaches, kiwis, there's a couple different quality or quantities, cost, total, um, and then there's three questions. So um, just to kind of get you through exactly how to how to do some of these, in the apples uh, under total, go ahead and highlight that. That should be uh, cell E8. Go ahead and hit equals. Now you can do this one of two ways. Uh, one of them is called hard coding uh, the, the numbers in. So you could actually just hit the number eight, hit the time sign, which is the little star. Let me go ahead and I will move this over here so that everybody can see exactly what we're talking about. Okay, so you can actually hard code them in there. So you could put eight times 0 0.30 for the 30 cents and come up with an answer, hit enter, and you'll see that it comes up with $2.40. Uh, that is, um, should we be able to see your screen? Yes. Does everybody not see my screen? I can see it. Uh, Marcy, we ran into this a uh, couple times before. Um, we found that if you exit out of the meeting and come back in, it should fix it. Um, it's, I, I don't know, it's a it's small little glitch we found periodically, so. Um, so going back to this, there is two ways to do this. You can either hard code the numbers in, um, or I stated before that you can use what's called cell references. So what you can do is it, when you hit equals, you can actually click on the cell that you would like to select. So in this case, I want to select eight, or, or I want to select the quality of eight. Um, then go ahead and hit the multiply and then hit um, the cost that you would do. So your answer would end up looking like C e, uh, C equals C8 times D8. And if you hit enter, you'll get the exact same uh, answer of 240. Now, the big reason people will use cell references over hard coding is if by chance we said, oh, I forgot and I actually bought 11 apples instead of only eight. You can actually change the quantity here and it will automatically update your, your total. So it's that those that's the big reason people will use cell references and cell arrays rather than uh, using individual actually hard coded numbers in there. So, um, so again, go ahead and I'll give you probably only about probably thirty seconds, sixty seconds. Go ahead and fill in the quantity, the cost, and the total here for these three cells using just the basic math. And if you have any questions, please, uh, I have the chat open. You're welcome to put it in there, or you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Luann, do we need to make up the cost of the peaches? No. So with the cost of the peaches, how would you, I mean, if you look at this, you know the grand total and you know the quantity, how would you come up with the cost?
All right. OK, so for bananas, um, so always start with an equal sign. In order to come up with the quantity of bananas, we have the total and we have the cost. So we would take the total, we'll divide it by the cost. So you, so you can use the cell references. Again, you could hard code the numbers in there if you wanted. Um, and once you have, so your formula should so look something like E is, or let's see, equals E10 divided by D10. If you hit enter, you should come up with seven. Uh, for peaches, same idea, but instead we're going to use cost and quantity. So we're going to use the total divided by the quantity. And that should look like equals E11 divided by C11 is equal 50 cents. And then Kiwis, similar to what we did up in apples, uh, we're going to take our cost times uh, our quantity cost times our cost, excuse me. So C12 times D12, and you should come up with $3. <clears throat> uh, now looking at the questions on the side, so the total cost or, or the total fruit bought. So if I'm looking to figure out how much, how many I bought of each, not the total price, but the how many, uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, I've seen people to where they'll hit the equal sign and then they will simply click on each one individually. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that. Um, I've seen it done quite a few times. But if you have, say, 40, 50, 60 cells that you're trying to add up, um, that starts to be quite a bit of adding, making sure you hit the plus between each one of them. Um, so we get a total of 27 that way. The other way is to actually use the sum uh, formula. So hit equals and type in the word sum. Now you'll see down below, you will see a pop-up of different ones coming up. Um, what Excel does is as you start to type formulas, it tries to predict and guess what, uh, what formula you would like to use. Um, if you see the one on here, um, you can simply double click on it and it will fill in. If you hadn't typed the entire formula, it will automatically type the rest of it in and it will open the set of parentheses. In addition to, you could also highlight uh, if you were to, uh, for some, for example, let me go ahead and try to show you this. So some is the top one. It's highlighted in blue. If you hit tab, um, it does the exact same thing. It fills the rest of it in and then opens a set of parentheses. So once you have that set of parentheses in there, you can do one of two things. As it states up here at the top, you can actually do each number followed by a comma. So I could click C8, comma, C9, comma, and do it that way. Or there's something called cell references or a cell array, um, in which case you click on the C8 and you drag it all the way down. So your formula looks like equals sum, open parentheses, C8, colon, C12, and you just simply drag that down for what you want to total together. Make sure you close your parentheses at the end and then hit enter, and you'll see that we come up with the exact same 27. So there's two ways to do the add and subtract. Uh, total apple, or the total of apples and peaches bought uh, is a simple addition. Uh, so we bought eight <clears throat> apples, and there were seven, oops, excuse me, peaches. There were five peaches that were bought, so C8 plus C11. So 13. Uh, the last question, um, if you brought $20, um, how much change would, did you do? So if you have a total here of all of this money and you brought $20, uh, I'll give you about 15 seconds to try to figure that out with a formula. And then I'll want someone to try to tell me what their formula is. While well, we're doing that, <clears throat> my three dollars, you know, for the total of the amount spent, uh -huh. not the dollar sign, dollar sign on there. Uh, to add the dollar sign, you can use one of two ways. You can either format it up on the top by hitting the dollar sign. Um, are you on Google or are you on Excel? Excel. Okay. So up at the top on the ribbon, there is a numbers option. You can there's a dollar sign right on right there. You can simply click on that and it should add the dollar sign for you. So I've noticed that when I do that, it moves it kind of like out front. Uh, 
because because the others for the oranges and bananas and peaches the dollar sign is right there in front of it and then if i click on the apples or the uh, it oh. looks whoops I, shoot i can do that uh you mean it looks like that yes it um so there are two different uh formats for numbers um this is called the one just in front of it is called the currency um if you look at the formatting cells um uh it shows you an example shows you dollar places um then you can also change it to different forms different currency throughout the entire world okay. um the other one is called accounting um again you can also do a lot of it throughout the different type of world i don't know why they decided to give two different uh categories for uh dollars but one of them is accounting and one of them is currency there's right. nothing for us there is nothing different so just pro just preference right yeah yep. thank you sure okay uh does anybody have the formula on how they got the the answer answer for you brought twenty dollars I'll help somebody out and say it starts with an equal sign. Equals sum. Okay, F13. Okay, so Luann, it looks like you did a total. So in F13, you did a sum here. You totaled all of that up. And then you went equals the subs. Okay, so you equals the sum of 20 minus that and close your parentheses, 1050. Yep, that works. Um, I have seen other people to where they will do 20 minus the sum of all of that. Um, the only difference is between the two is I didn't have the second cell reference, which is fine. Um, honestly, with formulas, there are multiple ways to do it. And that's why I always kind of ask what people, how people did this um, is because there are multiple ways to do it. Um, if you did it a different way, then that's fine. Um, as long as you come up with the total of $10.05, you're good to go. Uh, any questions before we continue to move on? What was that first formula? Uh, the total fruit bot? No, the, the first the, one we oh, did for the bot 20, how much change? Uh, so she went with the sum of equal of 20 minus um, F13. So she totaled up the total here into a new cell, and then she went ahead and subtracted the two. All right, thanks. Okay. And, all right. Okay, count. So go ahead and go to the set, go to the count page, or count tab um, on the bottom. Uh, count returns a number of cells that have numbers within them. Um, again, um, as we remember from two weeks ago, numbers can consist of um, uh, I or, or the value uh, within count can be um, items, cell references, ranges. Remember that the term for number can consist of formulas, dates, percentages, actual numbers. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, Numbers, there's a lot of categories in which it classifies as a number. Uh, and so what count does is count simply counts the number of uh, the number of numbers, if that makes sense. So go ahead and go to the count page and you'll see that in E5 or I guess D5, I have a results page. So what I want you to do is in E5, I want you to put the um, formula to count how many cells are inside of between uh, B4 and B13. OK, does someone have the result? Six. Okay, and what was the formula that you used to get it? Isn't it just equals count and then choose all your values? 
So I did, you know, B4 through B813. Yep. And then make sure you close your parentheses and you should have six. So again, if you look, you'll see that it counts the dates, it'll count the percentages, it'll count the decimals, uh, but it doesn't count anything that is text. Um, now this, sometimes we run into issues and that's kind of where the second option, or that's where the second uh, result comes, or the, or the second formula that we talk about. Um, you'll hear every once in a while, and I, you, you could have heard it before, people will say, I'm gonna use the counter formula, so the count A formula. Um, and that's our next one, and that's our next uh, formula to talk about. Uh, the counter formula uh, returns the numbers of cells containing text, numbers, formulas, functions, and including empty text as well. Um, so this really will count anything. If there is anything within a cell, it will count it. Um, and that's using the counter formula. So if you go to the counter formula page, uh, tab down on the bottom. Again, you'll see in D5, I have a result. You'll see that I have a bunch of values. Um, I want you to use the counter formula in E5 to figure out the result. And when somebody has that, go ahead and let me know. That'd be 11. Okay. 11 is the right answer. Now, if you look at the values between there, you'll see that there are two blanks in there. Now, if you go through and count each one of them that has an actual value, you'll actually get the number of 10. Because um, you'll see 1 through 5, 7, 8, the text, 10, and 12. Now, as I stated, the count of formula does count any cells that have just a blank string in them. So that includes essentially just a blank space. Um, so if I went into the if I went into the cell, hit space, hit enter, it's counted as a value of sorts. And so that's why the number results in 11 rather than just the 10 because of that blank space. Uh, questions on count and counter. So does the count uh or whatever, does that stand for count all? Yep. Yeah, the counter stands for count all. Uh, one thing I'll also state within with Excel, um, down in this bottom corner of Excel, uh, you'll see display settings, you'll see your zoom and everything else. Um, one thing that I also that I use quite frequently is when you highlight a bunch of cells, you'll actually see that there are a couple other options that show up down in the bottom. Uh, you'll see that it's an average, you'll see a count, and you'll see a sum. Uh, by default, Excel will always show you the average, the count, and the sum of, of everything you have highlighted. Um, so whether that's an entire column, row, a cell array, whatever, it will always show you. Now, the count is unique because it says count, but how it figures it out is it actually uses the count of formula. So if you look at it, it does state that if you do highlight uh, B4 through B15, you'll actually see that it says 11 down in the bottom uh, right hand corner. And that's because it uses the counter formula to actually figure that number out. So even though it states that it's the count, it actually uses the counter formula. Hope it doesn't <laughs> screw you up on exactly what that means. Okay. All right, average. Average is just as it states. Um, we all know how to calculate the average. The average returns the average of the group number supplied. Um, when you use the average, it automatically adds up all the numbers together and then divides it by the total numbers. Uh, so if you use an array, it simply totals up the number of cells within that array with a value in them, and then it divides it by the grand total. Uh, one thing to know about this is the function does automatically ignore blank cells. Um, so rather than adding a zero in there, if you just leave the cell blank and you come up with an average, um, that is a big difference between leaving it blank versus having a zero in there. So uh, go on to the average uh, tab, and you'll see that I've got a, it's a page of test uh, that are, um, test results. You'll have the average on in column H. So on Abe go ahead 
and hit equals and then type average. And if you, again, if you start typing average, you'll see that the average uh, option comes up. If you just hit tab, it will go ahead and highlight them or it will fill it in and then open your parentheses. Then go ahead and hit select C4 through G4 and then close your set of parentheses and you should come up with an average of 78.8. So your formula should look like that. Now, we have, this case, we only have five other students to come up with it. We could go ahead and type in average, um, but there is a handy little tool called the autofill tool within Excel. Now, I will show you, it's super small, um, most people usually don't see it. In the, it, go ahead and select uh, H4 where you wrote that average. And you'll see down in the bottom right hand corner, there is a green square. Um, it's tiny, um, but if you hover over it, you have this like solid plus that comes up, black plus. If you click it and drag it down and then let it go, if you go ahead and start clicking on the rest of them, you'll actually see that the average does show up in your in your uh, formula bar up top. What it does is when you use cell references, the way Excel works is cell references don't say, oh, this is C4 through G4. That's what we see as the user. The way Excel recognizes it is from this cell, I'm going to go five cells over and no rows up or down. And then the last one you want is one cell over, no rows up and down. And so when you when you copy and paste, you can you could also copy and paste this if you just hit control C, highlight everything you want and hit control V to copy and paste. It does the exact same thing as the autofill. But what it does is it uses that same logic and fills in the rest of the averages. So autofill is a super useful feature. I use it quite frequently in all my stuff, especially if I'm coming up with uh, student averages or I'm coming up with date differences or something like that. Something that I have to fill in a lot of rows. Um, I look at state level data, so I use this quite frequently whenever I come up with that kind of information. So you'll see that Abe is 78.8 and you'll go all the way down. Uh, go ahead and take a look at Tiny for a quick second, and you'll see that Tiny has 62.75. Um, again, as I stated, the average actually ignores um, zero, ignores cell um, blank cells. But if in self in in test five, if you go ahead and put a zero in there and hit enter, you will see that the average does change from uh, 62.75 down to 50.2. So when you're using the average, make sure you're uh, make sure it, you understand that it is ignoring those blank cells. And if you want it to do ignore them, great. But if you want them to calculate as a zero, then make sure you actually hit zeros in there for your average. Okay. Uh, questions about average. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about if. Uh, if is one that I use quite frequently. Um, if tests uh, whether certain conditions are true and then it reacts differently whether it's true or false. So it does a logical test, usually a true, uh, it does a true false test and that could be anything from uh, greater than or equal to, to less than, to equal to. Uh, those are really kind of your logical tests, uh, the three logical tests within it. Uh, but it takes the logical test and then it says, if it's true, I want you to do something. Otherwise, I want you to do something else. So let's go ahead and go to the if um, tab down at the bottom. And you will see that there are a bunch of test scores. Now we want to see how these test scores, you know, um, for, the, for this case, if it's 70 or above, we want to label it as true. Um, but if it's 70 or, or if it's below 70, we want to label the result as fail. Um, 
So for Abe, go ahead and hit equals, and then we're going to type if, and then open your set of parentheses. Now, the logical test is to test to see whether this score meets our criteria. So we're going to click on the score, and then our test is to see whether it's greater than or equal to 70. Now, the way you write that in Excel is you write the greater than sign, and you can hit the equal sign right after that, and it, that will tell this computer, tell Excel, that I am comparing it and I want it to be greater than or equal to a value. Now, in this case, I state that I want my value to be 70. So you can hard code the words, the, the number 70 in there. Um, again, as I stated before, hard coding uh, can present uh, problems. Like if, for example, um, you decided to increase the range and said, well, we're going to increase to where it's 80 or below, um, or 80 and above is pass and below 80 is going to be fail. Uh, if you hard code in that 70 number, you're going to have to go in and modify every one of these uh, formulas later. Um, you could put 70 up in, say, E4, and then reference it there, and that way you can change it later. Um, in this case, we'll just go ahead and hard code it um, just for the sake of ease. And then go ahead and hit comma after the 70. Now, when we want the when we want Excel to return a string, so a word, um, you have to put it inside of double quotes. So in so open a set of double quotes, write the word pass, and then close it. And that will tell Excel, I want you to return this value, and this value happens to be a string. Um, if I wanted to return, you can return a specific cell as well. So if you had a, a cell that said pass, um, you could reference that. There's multiple ways, again, to do this, but we are going to go ahead and hard code that pass in there. Then go ahead and hit comma, and the other one is fail. If the student doesn't hit 70, we want to go ahead and fail. So once you have both of those in there, go ahead and close your set of parentheses and hit enter. So you can go ahead and you can see very well that 82 is above 70, so it's passed. That works. So go ahead and take this, and then you're going to autofill it all the way down. And once I autofill it all the way down, you can see that every one of these is now a pass fail. Is there a way? <clears throat> is there a way at the same time to have the fails like show up in red? Yes, um, that is called conditional formatting. Um, so up here in the styles, there's a conditional format. And the way you would do it is you'd say, I want to highlight the cell um, if it's uh, equal to. Um, if it's equal to, in this case, you wanted it the word fail, um, we would highlight it in red. Now you could specify, you can, you. this is just the generics. There is a custom format as well, but you have all this. I want it in red text, for example. I want the word fail, and then I go ahead and hit OK. And then if I fall, copy it all the way down, you can see that all my fails are now in red. So that's called conditional formatting. Um, that itself can take up an entire training just because of the amount of um, information that you can do within that. But yes, that's conditional formatting and you can do the same thing. Okay. Then. So it, it, it doesn't involve it within the formula in itself. It's kind of its own little special formula. Okay. Okay. All right. And normally when I do this, OK. Now, this is all great and grand um, if you simply wanted to, um, a pass, fail. But we don't always necessarily want uh, just a pass, fail. We don't want a yes or a no. We don't want a result. Uh, there are times in which it's like, well, if it's not this one, then I want to try a different value. I want to try a different value. I want to try a different value. Um, and those are called nested if statements. So nested if statements, will you can program it in there and you can write it in a, in a way that it will return more than one result based upon multiple conditions. Um, again, there are tons of different ways to do this. Um, this is just the the, the, the way I'm going to teach you is the generic, the most broad version to do this. Um, I helped someone recently um, with nested if statements, and we had to nest 13 different if statements together um, in order to get the results that we wanted. But 
So if you go ahead and look at the second set of results, um, we would go ahead and say, here are my A, B, C, D, E, Fs, a, a, a very basic uh, grade book. But depending on where they fall, I would want to return certain values. Um, so 90, 80, 70, 60, and then below. In order to do that, um, yeah, we probably, I think we've got enough time. In order to do that, um, the first one is pretty easy. If this value, so if my C2, C5 value is greater than or equal to 90, go ahead and return my A. I want it to return A. Now, if it's not there, I want it to go into a false statement, but in this case, I want it to test another theory. I want it to, or I want to test another logic value. So once you hit, once you hit that first um, comma and you go into this state, the fault statement, type if again, and you will see that it will open up another if statement. Now we're going to test it for the 80 value. So we're going to want to test the same thing. We want to test if C5 is greater than or equal to 80. If that's true, go ahead and return my B. Now we just need to type this the entire time to see, oops, to see if, or to essentially create our grade book. Um, so so grade books within, or an SIS um, within your own LEAs, it uses the same type of logic, except you don't ever see it. Um, 70 would be a C if C5 is greater than or equal to 60. I want to return D. Otherwise, I want to return F. Now, I will say the hardest thing about nested if statements is the ending. You always have to make sure that you close all of your parentheses. Um, Excel tries to give you a little bit of uh, help knowing how many set of parentheses you need to close, because you can see as you do it, each set of parentheses is a different color. Um, and when when you go ahead and you close them, you essentially want to close them all the way till you hit your first black one. Um, there will never be another black one, no matter how many sets of parentheses you open up, there will never be a second black. Um, they, they may repeat colors. You may see other reds and blues and purples and greens, uh, but you'll never see another black. Black is always the outermost set of parentheses. So once you have that, you can go ahead and hit enter. And then you could go ahead and drag that all the way down to the bottom. And now you have created your own grade book using nested if statements. Questions on nested if statements. Uh, show me how you ended it once more. OK, uh, sure. Inside of it. So when I get down to my 60, so I don't you have to kind of think logically about this. If it fails everything else, the, the last value I want to do is I want to return my F. Um, and so that's always my innermost. So you always kind of work from your most stringent outward. Um, and the reason this works is because if the score is above an, an, a 90, it's automatically going to fail. So you want that on your outermost. If I had flipped all of this and said, well, if it's greater than 60 as my first one, make that a D and then continue on there. Every one of these, except anything that fails, would actually result in a D. Um, so you kind of have to go your most stingent ones on the outside, your ones that are going to return the least and work your way in that way. And so your final one on the inside is always going to return. So this F or whatever your final fail value is, whatever that is, that's where you want it to return um, on the inside. And so if you couldn't see that on there, so that is what the statement should look like. Okay. Okay, go ahead and move on to ands and ors. 
Uh, ands and ors are logic statements. Um, you can use them in conjunction with uh, if statements. A lot of people do. Um, but it's nice because ands and ors or and specifically will test multiple conditions at the same time and it will return the word true or it will return true if all statements are true. Um, so that is the difference between and and or or will test all, all conditions and return if any of them are true. So it, it, it is a bit of a trick to know exactly whether you want an and or an, and or, an or, but if you want every uh, logic that you are testing to be to be true, then you got to use and. If you just want any one of the logics to be true, then you can use or. So mathematically, you're talking about the intersections and unions, correct? Yes. So on the and, uh, let's go ahead and go to the AMP tab. So on this on this first one, we want to return the word true if any of these statements are true. So if the score essentially is between 75 and 90, I want this to return the word true. Or I, I want it to return true. Now, you could plug this into a, an if statement to where I'm going to test all these logics, and if it's true, then I want to do something else. If it's false, then do something else. Um, in this case, we're just going to simply test to see whether it's true or not. So go ahead and hit equals and type the word and. Now, what we're going to do is it's after asking our first logic statement. What is your first thing we're looking for? So we want to test to see if this number is simply greater than 75. So we want to test to see if B5 is greater than 75. Since I'm using an AND statement, I'm going to put a second logic in there, and I also want to test to see if the same number, B5, is less than 90. So I'm trying to find a range of scores. I want to see who falls within this range. Once you have the B5 in there, close the set of parentheses. You can hit enter, and you'll see that the first one is true. Now go ahead and autofill that all the way in, and you'll see all the way down. Now the one people always usually seem to question, the one that always gets pointed out is, well, what about this one? Why is the score of 90 false? Is that a rhetorical question? No, I, I am curious. <laughs> why, 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 is the, why is the and returning this as a false rather than a true? Because 90 is not less than 90. 90 is not less than 90. Um, so yeah, we if, if we had put an equal sign next to it, then sure, it will return it as a true. But since it is less than 90, um, then that is that, that's that's why. Now, over on the or side, or again, remember, returns if any condition is true. So what we want to do is we want to test, and this is pretty basic. This is not anything super difficult. If this color name is red or green, we want this to return true. Now, you can do this with scores. You can do this with pretty much anything. But in this case, we're simply going to test some text. Because you can actually test to see whether um, text is equal to essentially another piece of text. Um, you'll see how that works in just a second. So. Go ahead and hit equals and then open up an or statement. Now our first logic is we want to test to see if this is the word green. So go ahead and highlight G5, hit the equals sign, open a set, a set of double set of parentheses and hit green inside of it. Again, anything that is returning or testing against text against a string value, you need to put inside of double quotes. That's our that's our first logic is is this word green? Then we want to test another one to see if this is equal to red. Now, you do not have to have this exact meaning. You do not have to have capitalization. You do not have to have, uh, yeah, capitalization. It, it doesn't matter if you typed it all lowercase. If you typed it all uppercase it'll still compare letters to letters. It, that, that doesn't matter. What about that extra space in between the comma and the second G5? Does that matter? Nope. 
Um, there are some people who prefer it. I like to always put a space in there. Just it, it helps readability. Um, lets me know that comma that that every every new in in this case every new um, statement is this is the beginning of a new statement. Um, but you can also not put a comma in there, and Excel will treat it the exact same. Okay. So this this comma right here is not being tested. Now, if you had accidentally done something like that, one, as soon as I close the set of parentheses and hit enter, Excel is going to freak out, say, because this isn't an actual formula. I'm essentially trying to test two logics, but there's no comma in between them. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so the comma here is simply, it's this comma right here. It's the one that's simply s separating between parameters is what it is. And I always put a space just for readability, but you don't have to. Okay, once you have all that written, go ahead and close your set of parentheses and then autofill it all the way down. And you'll see that every one of them that's red and green is true. All your blues are false. But again, I simply showed you how to do it within a string text. So if you are looking for, say, student names, um, that kind of stuff, or if you're looking at test scores, or heck, even using ands and ors, you could be looking at um, contact hours for students, for example. Um, you can use this kind of condition and then use some of the filtering or sorting, or you could end up putting it into pivot tables and doing information on there. So. This can become super powerful once you actually get a lot of different ones on there, but this is kind of the very basic on how to do it, on how to use ands and ors. And again, a lot of people will use these in conjunctions with if statements. I want to test a couple pieces of logic, um, and then I want to do something with that result. I don't want it to simply be true and false. Okay, questions with ands and ors. No buts. No buts. All right, here's all of our ors. Okay, concat. Um, whoops, jumped one too far. Uh, concat, the, the, the formula concat allows us to join text together. Um, they, there is the concat formula, as you see above. Um, Concat is one of those unique ones that actually has the ability to use the and percent sign um, instead of using the word uh, concat. Um, it, it's a little bit more easier to understand once you once you use it. So go ahead and go to the Excel sheet and go to the concat formula or concat page. Um, and I use concat quite a bit for actually this this very reason. I have first names, I have last names. I want to put them together in a single cell. I want to put them in a in a cell. Um, in this first one, in E5, I want to go ahead and um, concat uh, the first name of Wade, the last name of Watts into what would be look like a normal name with a space in between it. So go so ahead I, and hit E. Adam? Yes. So my, my screen on that same one, it doesn't have the names Wade Watts or James Halliday. It just says apples, pears, and 40. Okay. I changed this recently, and I forgot to upload the new one. Um, you can do the same thing. Go ahead and watch this one. Um, I apologize. I forgot to upload the new version uh, this morning. I thought I had I, – I I'd uploaded it, but apparently I uploaded an older copy. No worries. If you use the word concatenate, you can kind of do the same thing. You'll see that there are sets of instructions on that one. Um, on, on, on kind of what I was looking for with the older version, but I figured this was a little bit more relevant or prevalent for what we actually use because I use this quite frequently to combine first and last names. Um, so type if you were to type in the word concat and then you can use the cell references. Um, once I have the first value that I want in there, you go ahead and use a comma. It's, it will separate all the text that you're trying to combine together into one. Now, in order to make it look like this, I can't just put Wade and Watts next to each other and have them next to each other. Because if you hit enter, you'll see that there is no space in between there. 
in order to add that space, I need to actually tell the system that I am actually wanting to add a space. I have to put it in the text that this is a new piece of text that I'm adding. So I have to add that space in there. And then if I fill that all in again, because I'm using cell references, it will automatically fill it in for me. This is how I do a lot of name combinations within Excel or within um, all within Excel, within Utopia, that kind of stuff when I have it in Excel. Now, the second way to use the ampersand sign is very similar. Just I do not need to type the word concat before it. So if I open up a set of, if I open up a, a equal sign, I can simply hit the cell. Actually, in this case, I wanted it to do last name, comma, first name. So I want the last name first. Then if I hit the ampersand sign, open up a set of quotes and add my comma in there because it's not anywhere in here that I'm using. So I'm going to add the comma in there, hit another ampersand sign and hit the last first name, hit enter. And you'll see that it's the last name, comma, first name. And then I go ahead and I fill all of that in. Um, once this is done, I will go ahead and upload a brand new version of this. I'll make sure that this is the latest and greatest. Um, that way you could actually play with this. But either way works for concat, it doesn't matter. Okay. Can you go back to that slide? I'm just kind of trying to create my own real quick, just with your, your notes there. With this one or with the other? That one right there. Almost done. You're good. All right, we might run a little over as we got started just a little bit late. If you have to leave at 3.30, um, we're, we're recording this, so go ahead and um, you're able to take off and then you can finish. But I'm going to go through the rest of these um, with the time that we have left. I should, We shouldn't be much more than about five minutes, maybe 10 at most, so we're going over. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, now and today. Um, these are two formulas that I use quite frequently when I'm comparing dates. Um, now returns the current date and time. Um, and today returns just the current date. So it kind of depends on whether you want time associated with what you're comparing or not. Um, I usually use today because I don't necessarily care about the time, but uh, sometimes you do care about time. Um, these are two formulas that don't take any parameters. There are there is no parameter that you can actually add in there, um, but it does require a set of empty parentheses to add, put in there. Um, all formulas need the set of parentheses. Um, in this case, this is just an empty set that you make afterwards. Um, both of these will actually continually update every time the worksheet is refreshed. Um, uh, refreshed is kind of a, a, a generic term. Uh, refresh can be when a new value gets entered. Um, so if you're doing a, a, a new value, a new date, um, a new uh, line of text, um, it will also, re refresh is also when you uh, close down Excel and open it back up. Um, that, that will also refresh all formulas, refresh all of these formulas. Um, if you need, if you haven't really done anything um, and you want to refresh, um, if you hit F9 on your keyboard, it actually forces the entire sheet to recalculate and update all values. Uh, you'll see that when we do the now formula, um, you can use F9 and that will actually uh, update for you. So go ahead and go to the, I believe I called it the time. Yep. Uh, so you'll see that in uh, column B, I have a now, and in column E, I'm talking about today. So in the results, go ahead and hit equals, type the word now, and make sure you put an open and close set of parentheses. And go ahead and hit enter. Now your results should look pretty much the same as mine. Today is the, t the 16th of February, 2021, and the time is 
1527, so 327 in the afternoon. Um, if you wait until your the your system clock on your computer has refreshed over into say 328, um, you can refresh it. Um, you can hit F9 and it will automatically refresh. You'll see that it pulls then 1528. Now, some people will want to do um, uh, modifications, manipulations with the date. They want to see what happened, you know, last week. What is uh, how many days from now? Um, it's actually really simple to do. Uh, go ahead and hit equals, type in now, and use a set of opening uh, parentheses. Now, if we wanted to see this exact same time last week, it's minus seven. Uh, the way these formulas interact with numbers is it uh, interacts with them in full days. So this time last week was 2-9 two two of 2021 at 15-28. So essentially it just took the 16 and subtracted seven days from it. And the opposite actually happens as well. So if you say I want now plus seven, I want to go forward in time. I want to see seven days from now. What is that? Just add seven to it and you'll see that it is now 223 at 1529. But if you also look at your now value, you'll now see that it says 1529, may see 1528, depending on when you last did it. Again, this is the system pulling in and refreshing every time you enter new values. Okay, today. Today is virtually identical to now. Go ahead and hit today, open a set of quotes and close them, and you'll see that all it does is it simply shows the date. There's no time associated with it. Um, I use today quite frequently when I want to compare uh, date date values. So how many days has, say, students been in, in, um, enrolled in, my, in the program um, from the beginning of their uh, enrollment to today? Um, I have to add a date formula in to do that, and this is how to do it. Uh, for the one week ago, you do the exact same thing. So to the today minus seven and the today, oops, the today plus seven and one week from today. Again, it those two formulas interact with numbers by simply adding and subtracting days. Okay. All right, the second part of time is the month, day, and year. Um, all of these kind of do exactly what they state. They get, um, as long as you have a date formatted within uh, Excel as a date, um, doesn't matter what version of date that you use, um, but if you have a date uh, formula or a or a date within Excel that's formatted correctly, it will always pull the correct either month, day, or year that you are looking at. So over on our sheet, you'll see that I have some examples over on the side and starting in column H. Um, so you'll see I have 1, 1 of 17. I have the Monday, June 15th of 2015. I simply have 4 of July and 30 September of 16. Every one of these are valid formats for dates in inside of Excel. Now, if I wanted to pull the month out of this, it equals month, oops, and then put this, um, the date that you are looking for in there. So in this case, it's going to be H4, and go ahead and close your set of parentheses. Month and day will uh, pull numbers. It will not try to format it versus, you know, January, February, March for the month or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for the day. It will simply return the number that it that is associated with that. Uh, day is the exact same thing. Hit equals day and do your formula. Close your set of parentheses and hit tab. And then year is the exact same thing. Hit equals year. I want H4. Close your set of parentheses and hit equals. Now, rather than going through and typing each one of these, you could simply drag each one of them down. But since I'm actually wanting to copy all this, um, you can use the autofill over multiple uh, 
cells. Just highlight the cells that you are wanting this copy down and then use the same autofill feature down in the corner and you'll see that it drags it down. Now, the question uh, that I always pose is, how did this number of 2014 get pulled from this format of July 4th? Does anybody know? <clears throat> you must have typed it in there in the original date. Yeah. So if you look up, if you highlight over July 4th, you'll see up in the up at the uh, formula bar, it says 7 4 of 2014. Uh, one of the formats that Excel has will actually get rid of years, but whether the year is actually visible or not, um, the formula still goes in and finds that year. And so if mine says 2018, I hover over there, it shows 2018, correct? Correct. Got it. Okay. All right. Date diff. Uh, one of my mo one of my favorite formulas to use uh, date diff returns the time between two dates um, and you can return it in months, days or years. Um, in order to return the unit, that final uh, parameter, um, you have to format it like this. It's the only time that you're not actually returning a string, but this is the way that date diff works. Um, if you want days, you have to put inside of double quotes, months or years inside of double quotes. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it kind of depends on what unit you are looking for. Here's the catch about date diff. Date diff is actually known as a compatibility function. And the reason why is date diff works in all uh, versions of Excel. Doesn't matter whether you're using the 2014 version or the most recent version. Um, it's always there. The catch is, is it doesn't have that help menu. So as you as we've been going through that every once in a while, I don't know if you've seen, there's a little yellow bar that pops up underneath that will start to help you to know which uh, parameter you are working on with your uh, formulas. Date diff doesn't have that little help menu. Um, this is one of the best quotes that I have found for uh, putting any of my trainings together is uh, Chip Parsons, he does a lot of stuff with Excel um, for Microsoft. He says date diff is treated as a drunk cousin at the formula in a, of a formula family. Excel knows it lives a happy and useful life, will, but, but will not speak of it in polite conversations. It works, it does everything that it, you want it to, it just won't help you. Um, there is a catch. Google Sheets, on the other hand, does have a help menu. If you use the date diff formula in Google Sheets, it actually shows you which uh, parameter you're working with. I have a feeling that sometime in the near future, um, date diff will actually have a help menu inside of Excel, but we might always treat it as a drunk cousin. So how to use date diff? Uh, this is one formula that you just kind of have to memorize the, the order of the parameters being that it has no help. So on the date diff, um, we have a couple of start dates, a couple end dates, and we have units. Now, being that I have the units specified here, we can actually use the, we can use um, cell references to get these. Um, if I didn't have units, in fact, I will say, probably 99% of the time when you use a date diff formula, you will not have a unit that you are trying to specify in a specific uh, cell. And so you'll have to type it in. But go ahead and hit equals and hit date diff. Again, you'll see that nothing pops up on the bottom. No help is gonna come from you. And then go ahead and open a set of parentheses. At that point, it will show a little gray box saying, hey, we do recognize this, but good luck, kind of an idea. Um, up at the top is the order of the parameters. So you always start with your start date. What date do you want to start calculating from? In this case, it's B4. Hit a comma, and then it looks for an end date. Our end date in this case is C4. Now, as I stated before, I use that today formula in order to figure out differences in dates. 
you can, if you wanted to, if you were trying to figure out as of today, you could plug that today formula right in the middle of it. And that will always calculate as of today. Or when you drag it down, it will calculate that. So you can plug the, the today formula in the middle. You could also go into say G1 and plug that today formula in and reference that. This is where I use that today formula quite frequently. But right now let's go ahead and use C4. Now, I want to know how many completed years this is. That is the catch about date diff. Date diff will return the number of completed years, months, or days. It's not going to say, oh, you completed two and a half months. It will say you completed two months. And that could be at day 29 of that third month. So it will always show you the fully completed months, days, or years, depending on what you're asking for. <coughs> So the unit we're looking for is you can either reference D4, you can either type it in or select it, or if you hit the double quotes, you can type the Y in there and then close your set of parentheses. You'll see the result is two, because of course between one one of 2016 and one one of 2018, two completed years have showed up. To show you that it's completed years, if I did 1231 of 2017, even though this is technically two completed years, we would recognize it as two completed years. It's technically not because that 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 is not a completed year. This 2017 has not been a completed year. So again, it oops, my bad. Again, it shows completed years, completed units, whatever you're looking for. Now, months, let's go ahead and do the same thing. So we want the date diff formula. We want the start date, the end date, and we want months. And for the days, we want the start date, the end date, and we want D in there. Oh, I put a set of double quote or double commas in there. Okay. Y is my result on D 731. How many days are there's 365 days in a year. You double that and you end up with 330 or you, you should end up with 330. Why is my result showing 331? 731. Yeah, that's what I meant. 730. Why is, why is my result showing 731? Uh, one of the years has a leap year in it. Correct. 2016 was a leap year. Uh, the nice thing, the most beneficial thing about date diff is date diff always will recognize leap years. Um, some people will try to just do subtractions between this. So I want to subtract this date from this date and figure out how many days. It won't necessarily return you the exact amount that you want. Um, and especially with birth years. Um, this is the most accurate way to see students' birthdays. Um, to figure out birthdays is to use the date diff formula. So very useful formula. Excel doesn't help you worth squat in this one. It's the, it's the one formula that is super useful, but not, not useful. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is auditing. Um, and I use this quite a bit. Um, you or I, every once in a while, I will receive a sheet from either a colleague or I've received it from heck, one of you guys. Um, and there could be formulas in there that are all over the place. Um, and again, this section is specifically in Excel only. Um, there is no formula auditing type pieces in Google Sheets. This is only within Excel. On your Excel, um, if you go to the formulas tab up on the top, it should be the fifth tab up there, you will see a section called formula auditing. Now, there's a couple of them in here that I use on a regular basis. Um, these for the first two that I use are the trace precedence and the trace dependence. 
And the way both of these ones work is they use arrows to show um, how an individual cell is either linked to or linked from other cells. So the best way to kind of show is to just kind of show you how it works. Um, so if you look at this, it's a simple tax rate. I have a tax rate of $18 or 18%. Here's my values that have been spent. Here's my tax value. Here's my total tax that I spent and then my total. Well, if I look at this and I want to know, now this is a super simple five thing. Uh, five. I want to know where you got this um formula from what what cells is this calling in order to do that and that's what i want to use my trace precedence so simply click on trace precedence and you'll see that an arrow shows up that arrow will highlight the box it highlights the array that is being used and it will point an arrow to that cell what this is telling me is this value right here is dependent upon these values I use this quite frequently to figure out exactly what cells are being used, where they're being used. And sometimes this is, you know, 50, 60, 70 columns wide, could be 300 lines long, but it will always point you to exactly the cells that's being used. So Adam, I'm getting a message that says the trace precedence command requires that the active cell contain a formula which includes value preferences. Shoot. I copied this in. When I copied this over, it actually copied in the values, not. Um, in, go ahead and in F2, go ahead and hit equals, type in the sum, and then highlight the values of the tax. Okay. I need to fix that. That is the catch about trace precedence and trace, uh, the, the, two, the two traces. They are dependent upon a formula. If there is no formula in there, of course, it can't trace anything because it says, well, I'm not being traced. There is no formula being used. Um, if you go ahead and it's not, it, again, it's probably not going to work because there is no formula inside of F3. But if you look on this on my screen and hit, and if I want to go, actually, let me go ahead and remove arrows. That bottom option of remove arrows is the only way to get rid of all of those traces. If I go ahead and hit trace dependence, what that shows for me, again, because I accidentally pasted the values rather than the formulas, is it will show an arrow pointing down to the total. And the reason it does that, it says, hey, this cell is being used in this cell. Now you'll see that when I click onto it, I am my cell reference is I'm wanting to take the sum of my values and I want to add in my tax total. That's how I'm going to get my grand total. But if I'm tracing my dependence, I'm saying that, hey, this value is used here. Now you can use multiple traces. You do not have to be linked to a specific trace value. So you can see that this value is being is using these cells and this cell is being used within here. Can I see your formula for F3? Oh, for F3. Yeah. Uh, so it's equals the sum of the values and then F2. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, error checking, um, I use uh, periodically. Um, Excel has some built-in rules to identify cells that may need attention. Um, you will see this quite frequently uh, in, in, in different cells, and it both within Utopia as well as within others. Um, the ones that are, are have not necessarily full errors, the ones that are throwing like an error message, but just you may want to identify there is something uh, unique or something you off about this cell are these ones that have a little green triangle up in the corner. Now, if you look at this, I have cells that reference this 18% um, in every one of them. That's how I figured out my tax rate. But 
if I look at this one, that's my 300, I, you will see that I have a green arrow. Now there's two ways to do this. You can either hit the error checking, which what that will do is it will show up a new window and it will say, hey, there's an error in B6 and this is what your formula is. And it will give you what the error is. This is calling it an inconsistent formula. Now the reason it does that is Excel likes things to be consistent. It likes things to be the same. But what does this mean by it's an inconsistent formula? I can simply go in and I can look and it says, well, I'm taking this value, multiplying it by B1. If I look at this value, I'm taking this value, multiplying it by B1. There's what, what looks to be a non-inconsistent or, or it, I, it doesn't make sense on why these are inconsistent. The last thing to use is called the display formulas or the show formulas button. If you hit this, it actually will turn everything from the values into the formulas. Um, this is a nice way to see um, how formulas are being used, how they're being used throughout the system. And then you can actually start to see like these formulas are inconsistent. You can now see exactly what is going on. Why is this wrong? You will see that the ones above it have these dollar signs. They're making them an absolute cell reference versus this one in B6 is using no cell. Re it's, it's not using, <coughs> excuse me. It's not using an absolute value. It's not using an absolute cell reference. So what it wants me to do is the, the solution is to copy the cell, the formula from above. I do that. It fixes my error. It changes it now to a cell reference. That error goes away and you're good to go. You can then turn off the show formulas and you'll come back to your values. Okay. I apologize. That took a little bit longer than anticipated to wrap everything up. Um, are there any questions? That was helpful for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, again, uh, I apologize that some of those sheets weren't what they should be. I will go ahead and I will update it that way. Um, we can, the, the recording will actually have what's needed to be. Um,